Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Magdalena Sepulveda. I'm the director of the Global Initiative for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. So I also had the pleasure of being one of the uh, drafters, the experts that contributed to the drafting of the guiding principles. It is a pleasure to be with you today in the fifth anniversary of the Avijan principles. And hi, my name is Joshua Castellino and congratulations, five years since the Abhijan Principles. That's really incredible. I'm delighted that you could join us today. Um, I'm the co-executive director of Minority Rights Group International and professor of international and comparative law at Derby University. And I too was involved in the drafting to try and look at this from the lens of minorities. But it's a brilliant, it's brilliant that we've got an exciting panel ahead of us. And Magdalena, why don't you talk a little bit about the principles themselves and get us started. I will be happy to do it. Well, it's been a long time now. So the Abidjan principles were adopted in February 2019 in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, and they were developed in a context of growing privatization and commercialization of education. So they really came in a, in a very, in, in the exact moment when they were needed. Uh, they aim to clarify the scope and content of the human rights obligations regarding the right to education, and they impact and give guidance to states uh, in order for them to comply with their obligation under the right to education. They specify the obligations regard regarding uh, free, quality, inclusive public education, um, the obligations to effectively regulate private involvement in education and fund free, quality, inclusive public education systems. The Abidjan principles were developed by a group of global education and human rights experts like Joshua and myself in those lists that we were uh, very pleased. And it followed a three year consultative process with decision makers, communities, and practitioners. Uh, they are quite unique because they um, were the result of transparent and a very broad consultative process uh, at the regional and the global level. Uh, and this consultation takes place in many countries around the world. Uh, they were a lot of background paper commissioned um, that developed the content of some part or some sections of the principles. And the drafting was led by a team of nine drafting uh, committee members and uh, adopted by very prominent um, signatories and that some of them were present at Abidjan at the moment of the adoption and some has endorsed the principle later. Joshua. Thank you for that. Now, colleagues, we have a super exciting program with a lot of different speakers here, but I should say it's not just Anglophone, apologies for, for that, but essentially we also have translation in French and Spanish. And of course, as is typical with these events, it will be recorded for a number of people who perhaps can't attend this particular time. So we don't want to be time zone centric on this. So it will be recorded. Unfortunately, because of the wealth of speakers that we have, we won't have time for direct question and answers, but you could write them in you could send them in and we will try and engage with that. Um, as you will already have experienced from the start of this we webinar, and thank you for the fantastic work, Emily, uh, you will see that the bios pop up in the chat as we speak because we want to minimize the, the protocols on this and hear from the experts. So with that in, in hand, let me just turn straight away to ask the first question. And essentially the, the questions have been framed and, and I'm going to call on you first, if I may, since, of course, you've been chair of the, uh, the Abhijan Principles Drafting Committee and such an inspiration throughout the process. Uh, let me maybe call on you and, and ask you, really, in your role as chair of the UN Committee on Rights of the Child, what do you think have been the main principles? And Anne, I'm going to apologize to you and others in advance that you will be given three minutes, I'm afraid, because we want to get the program through and hear from as many voices. But a real pleasure to have you, Anne. Over to you. Hello, Joshua, and greetings to everyone. It's absolute pleasure to be part of this celebration and another opportunity to mark um, the fact that the Abidjan principles were adopted in 2019. And each year, I think we have reflected back on how, how are we doing? How are those principles making an impact? So something that I've noticed in the last year is that there are 
increasing calls um, to strengthen the legal frameworks for um, the right to public education. There are new discourses happening. There are new players in the field. UNESCO has been stepping up. And there's really a lot of talk about um, how do we balance the fact that, yes, the right to public education is already there in the international law frameworks. And that is what the Abidjan Principles says. It gathered all of that international law and says, here it is, it's there, it's clear, and we need to regulate private education in order to ensure that we bolster and strengthen the right to public education. So more and more voices are, are being added, um, I find, and I think that this may indicate that the Abidjan Principles started conversations um, that has drawn in more players, that has um, refocused the interest and energy around the fact that it's an important moment to transform education for all the reasons that we know, for the fact that we learned a lot during the COVID pandemic, the, for the fact that we know we are on the verge of a an AI explosion, which is going to also require us to make adjustments. But within all of that, let us not lose the sight of who bears the responsibility for providing public education. And, and I think that that is what the Abidjan principles really help to do because they spell out in very clear terms what the state's obligations are and that the that state should not allow itself to become distracted by all the offerings of private education and should ensure that uh, the private sector's involvement in education is regulated in a way that um, doesn't take the emphasis away on the importance of the right to public education. I think that's probably about my three minutes with Joshua, so I'll hand back to you. Backed with richness as well, and thank you very much for that and the leadership role that you play in holding states to the fire, feet to the fire, in that, in imposing, in, in a sense, the, the principle of the public education. So Frank, if I may call on you next. Uh, in a recent collective statement, numerous organizations and individuals are now reclaiming public education for all. Could you perhaps elaborate on the necessity for such a call? I mean, why is this so important right now? And really, what are the primary action points that you've outlined in that statement? And how do they align with the Abhijan principles? Over to you, Frank. Thanks. Uh, greetings, colleagues. Uh, it's great to see everyone on this fifth anniversary. Um, that was quite a half decade. Um, we are, we're living in a precarious time. Countries around the world are facing autocratic movements. Corporations in the private sector have increasing power. We've got multiple military crises and we've got the looming event, environmental crisis of climate change. That's a lot. How should we respond? And the statement explains the importance of public education. It explains that public education creates the public and that we need to reclaim and strengthen to collectively face the challenges of today and our future. So in terms of uh, what the statement actually does and what the Abidjan principles have to do with the statement, the statement addresses both research on how public education does work and the difficulties facing the decades long endeavor of public education. It includes with five action points. First, prioritize the public. Specifically, the Abidjan Principles prioritize the provision of quality, public, inclusive, free education for all in guiding principles 17 and 29 to 31. And then we need to, secondly, robustly fund public education. This doesn't work without money. And that includes a minimum of 6% of GDP and 20% of public expenditure. And guiding principle 15 specifies that states must allocate the maximum of their avail available resources towards ensuring free quality education and then they need to continuously improve it. Number three, we need to stop funding education privatization. States, development finance institutions, investors, funders, intermediaries should ensure their funding is not going to support private and particularly commercial and for-profit education. Public funds should exclusively fund public education. And guiding principle 37 states that even in the state the situation of limited resources, states have to prioritize the continued provision of quality public education. So action point number four, we need to regulate and enforce regulations of private actors. 
all of the guiding principles and overarching principle four presents specifically what states must do, including the adoption and enforcement of effective regulatory measures towards private actors involved in the provision of education to realize the education there to ensure the realization of the right to education. And five, we need a narrative change. We need to change the narrative that highlights the successes of public education. Public education works when it receives sustainable support from states and the public supports public education around the world. So the statement combines all of these points and you can see that they map very well into the Abidjan principles. I'll conclude here. Brilliant, Frank, succinct and very clear. Thank you for that. Now, colleagues, we were going to hear from Farida Shahid and who's uh, done a visit to Finland as well. And you might want to look at the report that she's done. I'm not sure if it's, it's fully out yet, but Farida couldn't be here for unforeseen circumstances, but we have the researcher, brilliant researcher, Prachi Srivastava. Prachi, maybe, maybe I call, call upon you next. And maybe you can tell us in the context of the work that you're doing, the salience that the Abhijan principles have. I think the question is about uh, public education and 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 how it's relevant to our, our our lives, our world. And I think I would go back to first principles. Actually, um, the Abidjan principles are based on uh, regulatory institutional frameworks. There, but all of these are are you know values based. What is it that we actually value as a global society, as to, and and within our own within our own domestic context. And for that, it's important to understand that when we're driving towards an inclusive public education system, there are three main things that we want to see. The first is access. The second is inclusion. And the third is quality. And I don't say this in any ordered terms because they are all interlinked. Without access and inclusion, you cannot have quality. Without the other two, you cannot have each other. They're all interlinked. And what I think the principles try to do is to show in very concerted ways how these are obligations on states, but also to call on the public, on the community to demand those, those essential functions of society, to provide governments and institutions and the community with a touchstone to demand those rights. It is not enough for these to be on paper, they must be enacted. And if we go back to basic education, public basic public education, I would like to end with just two main points, which is that the family and schools are the two most fundamental institutions in the lives of children and young people. And without having sustainable, broad ranging access, support and inclusion for all groups, we cannot realize global social progress. So without this in a sustainable way to demand that we have that in a sustainable way, putting in resources, but actually looking at places where there are persistent gaps where there are persistent areas of discrimination, this is where the Abidjan principles can actually help to bring our global focus back onto the, the primacy of public education. Thank you, Prachi, very, very clear. So colleagues who are joining us late, most you're most welcome. Thank you for joining us for this celebration of the fifth anniversary. Uh, we've heard from Anne Skelton, we've heard from Frank, and now we've heard from Prachi. If I may just go back to you and to close off this section before Magdalena talks a little bit more about the trend of privatization and, and runs the next question there. Could I maybe just ask you what kind of concrete steps could you identify that states need to take? in terms of your role on CRC, for instance, what concrete steps do you expect of them? Well, I, I really do think that we can try to ensure that um, in treaty bodies, like the Com Committee on the Rights of the Child um, and others, such as the CRPD Committee and ISESCA, um, we can also be briefed by civil society to ask the questions of states that are not regulating um, and not, not aware of the Abidjan principles, and we can direct them um, towards the Abidjan principles. So that's one role that treaty bodies can play. Um, special rapporteurs obviously also do already 
I mean, I think the special rapporteur on education, um, this is clearly on her radar and she does do this already. But I think for treaty bodies, it might, might be a little less obvious. And sometimes we need to have this information brought to our attention um, because, you know, um, it, 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 we, we need to know all the detail about what's happening at the country level. And there's, a, there's an open process for that information to reach us. So just looking at it from my vantage point, I'm answering really with my Committee on the Rights of the Child hat on. I think that there's there's work to be done using the principles that could uh, feed directly into those processes. And I would say the UPR process is another key space where we could be doing this work. Um, so, so really the human rights um, frame, framework within the office of the, um, the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the Human Rights Council, these are all sites where this work can be taken forward and, and is to some extent, but there's always room for strengthening, I think. Always room for strengthening, and indeed, Magdalena, how do how does this sit with you in terms of uh, where we've got to before we start exploring privatization? Because again, this is a call uh, from the treaty bodies, in a sense, also to civil society and how we can engage through the UPR and through the various committees and the mandate holders. And of course, you've been a mandate holder yourself. Any comments to close this section off before we call on some of the others to talk about privatization as a trend? I, I think there is a vital role, and I think that we're going to explore that later today in this session, but this these principles that have been adopted outside an intergovernmental process have had already an enormous impact with uh, UN treaty bodies, with mandate holders, uh, and also with other, um, with other regions. So we are very lucky to have today actually a uh, representative of uh, economic, social, and cultural rights monitoring bodies from the Inter-American System and also the African Commission on Humans and People's Rights that can also speak and answer this, uh, these questions on the way in which it has, the principles have had influence uh, within their work. Thanks, Magdalena. So colleagues, you've heard about the notion of public education a lot now in this opening section. You think, well, you know, what's the problem? We have public education. Why, why are we worrying about this? But uh, there has been a trend of privatization, and we'd like to maybe explore that a little bit more about this trend of privatization and commercialization and the challenges that exist in, in I guess, combating or somehow addressing or restricting the reach of these challenges. So maybe if I can call on Priya, Priya Joshi. Priya, following the 2021-22 report on non-state actors in education, the 2023 GEM report examines the theme of technology in education. And of course, this is a key site now. And it's an area where a high and growing number of private actors are involved, particularly since the COVID pandemic, um, of it, yeah, COVID-19 pandemic. Could you maybe just highlight some of these findings and recommendations for our audience here today? Over to you, Priya. Um, congratulations um, on the fifth year of this landmark process. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak from the GEM report perspective. As you noted, uh, the 2021-22 report focused on the role of non-state actors in education. It acknowledged that a diverse set of uh, non-state actors are playing different roles in providing education, influencing education policies and practices, and in financing decisions of various sorts. Um, we spoke of technology providers as, as ancillary providers then. We highlighted the increasing number of technology providers, the concentration among established providers of textbooks, assessments, and online learning, and the growing interest from technology giants and small players alike. Um, we noted that these trends could uh, exacerbate inequality. You know, our recommendations for that year focused on the writing the rules of the game, targeted to governments, urging them to protect equity through financing, quality, governance, innovation, and policymaking. And we stressed the need for meaningful and effective uh, implementation of regulations. Uh, in 2023, technology took center stage. Uh, the report's rallying call um, was to keep learners' best interests at the center of a framework based on human rights and focused on edge learning outcomes and not digital inputs. And we had to really highlight this perspective since the use of technology in education is a source of intense debate, right? Uh, does technology democratize knowledge or does it threaten democracy? Does it level the playing field or does it exacerbate inequality? We recommended to decision makers that um, they should use a compass. You know, they should think about uh, whether technology is appropriate for context, whether it's equitable, whether it's scalable, and whether it promotes sustainable futures. Uh, 
Um, just to mention one point here, in discussing governance of partnerships between governments and private technology providers, we talked about three types of concerns, right? First, the companies have a stranglehold on data, which really raises concerns over the abuse of data use, violation of privacy and safety. Second, um, the, the use of platforms can affect essential pedagogical functions, such as teacher autonomy or student assessment. And third, uh, consumers can, of course, be misled through practices, uh, marketing practices. And this cannot be the norm. You know, decision makers have to look at the long term evidence uh, on costs and benefits. We need to protect learners and teachers' human rights, well being, safety, and privacy while using technology for learning. And I think for meeting the right to education, this is all critical new territory that requires our attention. Um, and to underscore how much we lag behind on urgent regulatory and policy frameworks, I just leave you with one statistic from our global peer profiles. As of 2023, only 16% of 200 countries guarantee data privacy in education with a law and 29% uh, with a policy. And in 41% of these countries, uh, the policies have been adopted since the COVID pandemic. So thank you. A very telling statistic of the journey that still lies ahead. And thank you for highlighting this. Could we maybe go to you next, uh, David, David Giban? Uh, in 2023, you co published the book Geographies of Globalized Education Privatization in, a, in, 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 in brackets S privatizations, in which you refer to the Abhijan principles. Could you maybe share some insights from your findings regarding the global trend? And again, perhaps in the, I'm, I'm sure Emily's been brilliant with this. Uh, she'll no doubt share the link to the book as well. Please, over to you, David. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this invitation and good afternoon. Uh, as you know, privatization of education is a global, complex and hybrid phenomenon that strongly relies on state action and political willingness to transform public education into quasi-markets. What we wanted to underline here in our research and in our book is that privatization of education is a nonstop process that's now first moving into new areas and second is taking the positive figure of what we call the edupreneur. I mean, entrepreneur of education, going from global edu business to small local edupreneurs. After decades of privatizing and deregulating public education, privatization of education is are looking to new frontiers in order to develop new markets and products. These ones are to be found in what, what was once at the margins of the education system and what was considered as non-profitable by private providers. I mean, uh, education priority areas, for instance, students with special needs, isolated rural area, and so on. Uh, in France, for example, in the face of public disinvestment in priority education areas, community organizations that used to take charge extracurriculum activities and benefited from public subsidies are now asked to transform themselves into entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs providing educational service in very poor neighborhoods. This is a major change because it informs us that privatization of education is not only about opening public education to new private providers. It's a larger process, transforming education both from the inside and the outside into what we call in our book, an entrepreneurial regime, education as an entrepreneurship system. Entrepreneur are of course now the positive figure of privatization. Uh, we are witnessing a kind of personalization of the privatization through emblematic figures of entrepreneurial success. In Europe, for instance, successful entrepreneurs are presented now as leader in disruptive innovation, aiming to transform the old world of education into a new one. In the US, each year, the magazine Forbes awards 50 majors and so-called innovating entrepreneurs. But entrepreneurs are not just some new private providers of education. They promote the idea that education is no longer a collective matter built into and for society, but an individual responsibility, supposedly successful, that asks to everyone to be its own entrepreneur of education. The Exponential spread of entrepreneur in all areas of education in, in many countries obviously reinforce social and educational inequalities. But David, we lost you briefly. You went mute. Okay. Uh, do you hear it's me now? Yes, okay. Yeah. Well, um, I think you're not lost. <laughs> I am for the moment. Well, I was just mentioning that entrepreneurs are not just some new private providers of education. They promote the idea that education is no longer a collective matter built into and for education, but an individual responsibility that asks to everyone to be its own entrepreneur of education. 
And to conclude, uh, the exponential spread of Edupreneur in all areas of education obviously reinforce social and educational inequalities. But Edupreneurs cannot replace public education. Edupreneurs are now here to be regulated both in the global north and global south, and the Abidjan principle could be of great help. Thank you. Thank you, David. Much appreciated. Uh, Edupreneur is a new word if you haven't come across that before. <laughs> May I call on you, please, Prachi, once again? I mean, your work has focused a lot on privatization and also low fee private schools. Um, and you've returned to this theme now. Could you maybe just what is your assessment, I guess, of the current context? And, and how do you see the Abhijan principles playing a useful role in these challenges? Over to you, Prachi. As you know, low fee private schooling is just one form of private engagement in education. Um, but it's a very important um, development uh, when we first started working on this 20 years ago, because it showed the gaps that were existing um, and, 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 and the need, at least at a community level, when the first wave of these schools started, there was a, there was a certain level of a need that, that was expressed in terms of those gaps. That then, as I've described, moved on to a second wave. And during the adoption and during the framing of the, of the Abidjan principles, that second wave was a much more um, commercialized chain movement and raised a lot of concerns. And that's what informed some of the discussions um, around you know, the commercialization of, um, uh, of, of, of education, even at the basic levels. But what we're seeing now, and, and what we have been seeing for, for a number of years now, is the emergence of networks, hybrid networks, which are very opaque, of private actors and public and hybrid actors that are, um, in a certain sense, coalescing to um, bring forward certain issues that do not always work in the public good. Most often, this is in the context of either a real resource constraint, for, resource constraint for education or a manufactured one. The real resource constraints for education are very strongly tied uh, in, in countries that are highly indebted countries, very strongly tied to questions around debt repayments, macroeconomic financing issues. And the manufactured constraints are in context um, in high income OECD countries where financing for education is continually being undermined and actually also being cut. What we see in those contexts, both in high income and low, low middle income countries is this rapprochement, a, a, a rather scary rapprochement of commercial interests within the public sector for education. And what that does is it moves education policy making into the private sphere outside of the um, normal channels of citizen engagement, outside of the normal channels of the institutional frameworks that we're speaking about here. So when we then think about how it is moving forward, there are a few things that the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us. And I'm just gonna be very brief about these three things. The first is, even though we have seen rather strong pushes uh, of private engagement and privatization in and of education, the public bodies for regulation still assume the greatest importance. We can see that very strongly in terms of what happened in March and April of 2020 at the height of the pandemic. The, the, it was the public bodies and the governance systems that decided school closures. It was the public bodies and governance systems that decided continuity. And in those countries and those domestic contexts where that was a strong functioning system and well covered public education systems, we saw fewer issues in terms of resumption of a basic level of good quality education. So that's very important to understand is even though we're talking about privatization in terms of who is in charge of the system and where are the strengths, that's in the public system with public levels of governance. The last two points that we learned, again, through the pandemic was that the emergence, I wouldn't say the emergence, the unfettered access that commercial education technology companies have had in our in our systems is, I think, 
um, probably the, the greatest shift that we've seen. And it isn't that there weren't private commercial players involved in education services before, there were. And it, and it, it isn't that we didn't have commercial ed tech firms involved in education, they were. But it was the almost overnight turn to giving these private corporations access to 1.7 billion learners. That is a huge market in terms of having direct access and control in our, in, in our public education systems. So how are we going to deal with some of those questions? And the final thing is moving public policy making into the private realm necessarily disempowers all, all of us. We, we, it becomes much more opaque. We can, it's much harder to hold private actors accountable it also sees a, a funneling of public financing to private firms, to private actors, which could better be spent. So I hope that the next five years, we focus on some of these issues when we're looking at how to rebuild our education systems after this very large and massive disruption that we've just seen. Thank you very much, Prachi. Magdalena, you wanted to say something about the question answers, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Joshua. As we're having a very solid audience of more than 100 participants, I want to remind all of you that the question and answers section uh, in your system, in your Zoom is open, and we have a team that will be responding your questions. Uh, so please, I would like to encourage everyone, the, the, the conversation, it is very complex, it's very interesting, so feel free to pose those questions in the system. Back to you, Joshua. Thank you, Magdalena, and also thank you to our, our speakers so far who have really been keep keeping us on time, and apologies, interpreters, and if we are going very fast, please do signal it. So, so in a sense, these principles, you know, framed by experts can often be principles that don't get any life, but really in terms of the, the Abhijan principles, life has been breathed into them by the way in which so many regional actors have engaged with it. So I just want to, before we close this particular section, maybe call on Madhavad Zakariam um, Mwandenga and perhaps Solomon Dasso, if he's here, to maybe reflect on this. You know, as the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, what insights can you offer on the privatization challenges that are specific to the continent? And I guess in what capacity do you believe the Abhijan principles can counteract the proliferation of private educational providers? Over to you, Madhavad. Well, thank you uh, very much, and uh, I'm happy to be uh, with you as you celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Abidjan uh, principle. I'll go straight into the questions, given the fact that uh, we are not blessed with enough time. Um, now, in the African context, some of the major challenges uh, to the realization of the rights to education involve around uh, the quality of education provided by states, as well as uh, the enforcement of the rights to education. According to a report on a study carried out by UNESCO in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the sub-region with uh, the highest rate of education exclusion, one-fifth of children aged between 6 to 11 and one third of youths aged 12 to 14 are out of school. This shows that states not only have uh, the duty to regulate the rights to education, but must also ensure the enforcement of the, the said rights. The low quality of uh, public education needs many individuals to rely on uh, private education, which has turned out, which in turn has made uh, the private education sector become a lucrative uh, business. That's the number of uh, private educational institutions are profit-driven rather than human rights-driven. Uh, this profit orientation sometimes veils the human uh, rights perspective to education, leading to discrimination in its various forms. Uh, not only is there a tendency for the more vulnerable groups such as women, the old child, persons with disability, persons living with HIV AIDS, and certain indigenous groups to be discriminated against, 
but there is also discrimination based on income level of the parents and uh, the providers. In essence, only a few persons from high income earning homes are able to afford the highest quality of education. However, they, they are being an equal plane where all have the opportunity to enjoy the highest quality of, edu of education. There was an issue to do with the proliferation. May I quickly deal with uh, that one right now? Uh, personally, I don't believe that the Abidjan principles can be used to counteract um, the proliferation of private education. Private education providers are going to be there and they will stay with us for as long as the states do not take up their responsibility of providing public education in order to ensure that uh, their realization by its citizens to the right of education is something which people can uh, count on. In my view, the Abidjan principles are meant to be the guidelines which provides the human rights obligations of uh, the state regarding their obligation to provide the uh, public education, and also the state's responsibilities to regulate public-private uh, uh, involvement in education. Even if states embarked on uh, privatization or commercialization of uh, public education, they ought to remember that uh, they have the obligation to provide public education and they also have an obligation to regulate private involvement in education. And this is where I think the Abidjan principles come in handy. I can just end up uh, on that one. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Mudford. Javier Palumo, on to you next, please. I mean, how does this experience that Mudford has talked about in the African context play out in the Americas? Over to you, Javier. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joshua, Magdalena, and congratulations for, for the organization of this event. It's a pleasure to be here sharing with such a standing colleagues and, and, and experts. I'm going to speak in, in Spanish in order to, to answer. Yo creo que el tema de la privatización de la educación en la región de las Américas presenta retos significativos en un contexto muy específico. Eh, es evidente que es un aspecto que afecta a la equidad y el acceso a la educación, educación de calidad para, para todos y para todas las personas. Y un aspecto que hay que tener en cuenta es que la, el continente americano tiene una gran diversidad y existen países que tienen aparatos de política pública bastante robustos, con tradición en la provisión de servicios de educación pública de calidad, y otros países que no logran tener aparatos de política pública que logren eficientemente brindar ese servicio con calidad y en todo el territorio. Y eso es una, una característica de, de la región que debe ser este, especialmente eh, considerada. Por otro lado, existe en nuestro entorno, en el, en el ámbito eh, regional, un contexto de, de expansión de proveedores educativos privados en el marco de este, ciertas características de segregación socioeconómica en, lo, en, en la que se dan eh, aspectos que ya han sido mencionados, eh, que es esta, esta, esta característica de solo determinadas personas que tienen determinados medios socioeconómicos logran acceder a una educación de calidad y que se deja a las personas más vulnerables y especial a ciertos grupos que son este, sujetos a formas históricas y estructurales de discriminación atrás. Y este eh, fenómeno en nuestra región, en la región de las Américas, especialmente en América Latina, se ve exacerbado por varias cuestiones. Una súper conocida, que es, que es una de las regiones más desiguales del mundo. Y la segunda es más coyuntural, más reciente, que nos encontramos en un momento crítico para lo público, en términos generales, donde sectores políticos, 
eh, con un discurso explícitamente crítico hacia lo público, hacia la, hacia la provisión de servicios públicos, inclusive servicios educativos, logran éxitos electorales con un discurso abiertamente contrario a la provisión de servicios públicos y a la financiación de servicios públicos y logran representación parlamentaria o posiciones de gobierno. En este contexto, los desafíos vinculados a la privatización son evidentemente enormes y los riesgos de una, pro, de una mayor proliferación de instituciones privadas, este, un, una disminución de la inversión y el apoyo en las escuelas públicas, las instituciones educativas públicas, es algo muy real para, para la región de América Latina y para las Américas en, en definitiva. Los principios de Avillán es, son fundamentales en este contexto, ¿no? porque la interrelación entre los estándares interamericanos de derechos humanos de carácter vinculantes este, expresados en el artículo 26 de la Convención Americana, el Pacto de Derechos Económicos, Sociales, Culturales y Ambientales, perdón, eh, Económicos, Sociales, Culturales de Naciones Unidas, el propio Pacto de, de, de San Salvador, que es el texto específico de derechos económicos, sociales y culturales del sistema interamericano, la interrelación de estos instrumentos de carácter vinculante, inclusive la propia carta de la Organización de los Estados este, eh, Americanos con estos principios nos permiten tener herramientas para enfrentar estos desafíos, instando a los Estados a garantizar un, el de, que el derecho a la educación se cumpla primordialmente a través de, de sistemas públicos. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Javier. So, colleagues, we have explored the concept of the Abidjan principles. We've looked a little bit at their content. We've looked at uh, issues that have emerged, emerged from them through privatization. We've looked at some regional examples. Magdalena, I'm going to hand over to you maybe to explore a little bit more how they have been used. Uh, thank you once again to all the speakers for keeping on time. We are exactly on schedule and I really appreciate it. Magdalena. Thank you, Joshua. I think that this 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 moment i mean to go into how these principles has been used it comes to the very right moment of this uh, of this conversation because they are unique the Abidjan principles what is not unique is that since the 80s there's been several um human rights principles that explain certain obligations of the states but what is unique is that not all of them are endorsed as quickly as the Abidjan principles have been endorsed. So in this commemoration and celebration of the fifth anniversary of the principles, we know now for a fact that they have been endorsed by many human rights monitoring bodies at the UN and at the regional level, and uh, by many mandate holders of the or, or UN special procedures, in particular those working on the right to education. Just to give you some flavor of uh, some also example at the regional level, uh, the general common seven on the state obligation under the African Charter of Humans and People's Rights in the con context of privatization of provision of services adopted by the commission in 2023, uh, they have the, the, prince, the Abidjan principles serve as a reference, as a key reference for this document. The same with the uh, Tashkent Declaration and commitments to action for transforming early childhood care and education uh, of 2022. And we also, and, and uh, we just heard from Javier, the Inter-American Commission on Human, on Human Rights Declaration on the principles on academic freedom and university autonomy adopted in 2021 the Avidian principles were also uh, a reference to this document. So this panel, we're going to hear from uh, colleagues from civil society organization, from the academia and from regional monitoring bodies, how the principles has been used by them. Uh, I'm going to first give the floor to uh, Johnstone uh, Shania. Uh, he's from Each Rights. He's joining us from Kenya uh, to this meeting. Hello, Johnstone. Very nice to have you here. I'm going to ask you a question. Could you provide concrete examples on how you have put the Abidjan principles into practice within your initiative uh, 
in each each rights Kenya. Johnson, do you have thank the you, floor? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, congratulations for the fifth anniversary for Abidjan Principles. As uh, an organization, the East African Center of Human Rights, Beach Rights, we undertake advocacy that champions right to education as one of our program areas. And having uh, a clear understanding that the Abidjan principles are anchored on the human rights principles, this is at the core of the work that we do, particularly on right to education. So how we've utilized the Abidjan principles uh, has been in, in last year and uh, um, in 2022 and 2023, we've realized that uh, one, for us to really engage and uh, create awareness uh, on right to education, there is need to have a clear framework. And Abidjan principles have been very clearly uh, instrumental in terms of helping us interpret what right to education means. Because in Kenya, there is, uh, like so many speakers have mentioned, there is a very big growing trend in terms of privatization. And sometimes even people, uh, people's rights are violated without understanding that education is a right that needs to be claimed because it is already enshrined in our legal framework. So we use the Abidjan principles, first of all, to create awareness, to help people understand, one, education is a right, which is a mandate of the state to make sure that everybody enjoys it. Number two, we have engaged uh, the uh, Ministry of Education officers in terms of helping them to understand that in, in as much as they are implementing education, it's not just a service. We want to, them to help understand that they are doing this because it's a right and they need to really ensure that in, even in planning and designing the education programs, this is very much uh, um, uh, taken into consideration. Uh, number three, we are continuing also to engage even the civil society organization to understand that, yes, education being a right, there's that need for us to push the government, to push the state to its accountability. Because when we say the state has to be accountable, we are saying we are pushing for the state to allocate enough budgets on education. Number two, we are pushing even for the implementers and the duty bearers at the grassroots level, at the school level, to make sure that they are looking and holding those in, in leadership accountable. How much is that money being used for the right purpose? And then number three, for the civil society organization, we are saying how can we utilize the existing framework? And the existing framework, which has already been highlighted, is the treaty bodies and the, the UPR. Like each rights, we are the secretariat for the civil society organization in Kenya. We have been engaging the civil society organization to understand the framework of the UPR and how to use that to hold the state accountable in terms of their performance. Right now, we are preparing for the fourth cycle for Kenya, and we are bringing together different actors. And I had the education cluster on the UPR process. We are already trying to review. We have already done a midterm assessment. We are compiling a report where we want to see how is the Kenya performing in terms of uh, delivering its mandate to the citizens, and what are the gaps that need to be addressed. So all these are uh, frameworks that we've realized that Bijan Principles is well much elaborated to help people understand from the right perspective to how the state needs to act, and even to the level of compliance. And we've been pushing, each rights has been very uh, instrumental and the center of advocacy against abuses, for instance, the breach issues. Uh, and we are looking at compliance. How is uh, non-state actors complying with the national regulations on education? So that's been uh, at the center of our work and the Abidjan principles has been taken positively. And finally, uh, Last month, we just worked on a paper together with the ministry officers. We did a research just to assess the implementation of quality education. And one of the issues that we brought into this at the discussions, it was the right-based approach to addressing issues of access, availability. And we looked at the, four par the five parameters the Ministry of Education uses in terms of access to quality education. Out of that, we have developed a policy brief that we are already engaging at the higher level at the ministry to see which are some of the policy and recommendations that we need to adopt. And one of them is the Abidjan principle speaking to the issues of access, availability, and affordability, where the state has to regulate private actors. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have uh, given us or shared with us very concrete examples how each right has been using the Abidjan principles with policymakers at the Ministry of Education at the local level, but also and in response of what and Skelton was saying at the very beginning, you're also using it with the UPR, uh, uh, with Kenya's UPR. So we see that there's been 
a, a, a very diverse ways in which you have been used. Now we're moving from Kenya to Nepal. And uh, we have uh, here Karuna Parajuli from the ICJ. Karuna, welcome to uh, the discussion. We know that the ICJ in Nepal uh, work with lawyers and judges. So we would really like to know um, what is ICJ doing or what, which engagement has been proven valuable in order to bring the Abidjan principles forward um, in, in Kenya or other parts of your region? Karuna, you have the floor. Yeah, uh, thanks, Magdalena. Um, I'm really happy to be happy to join this celebration from Nepal and share how we are engaging with Abidan principle. So, in terms of right to education, in the past year, ICJ has been working to popularize Abidan principles in the judicial committee uh, community, including lawyers and judges. So, particular uh, to Nepal, ICJ worked with Nepali litigating lawyers to train them on international laws, standards, and principles and right to education, including Abidan uh, principles, and we were successful to initiate uh, litigation. And for this, uh, we took some uh, reference of um, legal um, instruments uh, that actually enforce uh, the state's uh, role to ensure right to education. First, Nepal as a party to ICSR had an international obligation to fulfill this right. Second, uh, the new constitution of Nepal of 2015 guarantees right to education as fundamental right with judicial uh, remedies. And third, and importantly, uh, we also refer to international standards, including Abidan principles, to say that state has an obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill right to education. And while doing so, uh, we also raised concern regarding violation of right in terms of unregulated private um, actors um, and a lack of a proper infrastructure in public schools, a lack of access to books and learning materials. And in response to uh, this uh, case, the court for the first time made a landmark decision where it referred for the first time on Abidan principles and it ordered the private institutions to follow the government rules in terms of um, operating their schools. And secondly, it also, you know, we have this new federal structure in Nepal after 2015. So it directed the local government to uh, monitor the educational institution within its jurisdiction. And it has explicitly referred to the Abidan uh, principles. So now if we see the these litigating lawyers that we are engaging with, these lawyers, whenever there it comes, you know, the cases related to child rights, they're looking how right to education could be related and referred uh, in terms of Abidan principle. And uh, we support them in reviewing their read petition. And whenever I and our colleagues from ICC, we review their uh, application, read petition, then we see, you know, Abidan principles being claimed in their uh, writ petition, which is itself an um, example like how the lawyers are using it. And apart from that, uh, the lawyers have also, uh, during this process of uh, getting this uh, judgment, they have come up with the idea to form um, a group of public interest litigating lawyers group. So they are now, um, they are organized in their way to train the young lawyers. So just to sum up, I would say that these litigating lawyers in Nepal are using Abidan principles as advocacy tool to demand right to education on one hand. And on the other hand, they are also training the young set of lawyers to defend right to education. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, it, it's really a delight to see how in some countries, like, like the case of Nepal, we are going to have litigation uh, at the domestic level on, on the right to education. And hopefully those uh, by exhausting domestic remedies, we could also see this moving to the international level. Um, now I'm going to move to Commissioner Mandenga. Uh, and again, we are inviting him to get today. And it's it, this is very important because maybe not all of you are aware that the African Commission uh, was the first human rights body that mentioned the Abidjan principles in, in a resolution. And this was in 2019 and again in 2020, emphasizing the need to regulate private actors in social services. And then the commission moved for the adoption of a landmark general comment that should 
serve as an example to all other regional and global human rights bodies, that is the general common seven on state obligations in, in, in the context of the private provision of social services. That is the way in which the African Commission um, name public uh, services. So uh, Commissioner, I would like to ask you if you could elaborate a little bit more on how the Abidjan principles inspired the African Commission for the drafting of this document. Commissioner, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I think uh, it's something which we must uh, accept that in fact, uh, we really did draw some um, inspiration from uh, the Abidjan principles when we're considering uh, uh, the resolutions as well as the general comment that you have mentioned. And uh, first, I think I should start off by saying the need to address the regulation of private actors in social services has become more apparent over years. And I believe perhaps that is also the reason which led to the adoption of the Abidjan uh, principle. But you may be interested to know that uh, prior to that, uh, prior to the adoption of the Abidjan principles, actually the African Commission had adopted the Pretoria Declaration on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in Africa, and the principles and guidelines on the implementation of economic, social and cultural rights. Now, these instruments I've mentioned are generic in nature and do not address the specific issues related to education, as does the Abidjan uh, principle in the subsequent instrument. In a bid to reinforce the importance of such regulation in the promotion and protection of human rights, the African Commission also found it necessary to adopt resolution uh, uh, a resolution on states' obligations to regulate private actors involved in the provision of health and education services, which is resolution 420 of uh, 2019. Again, they read that uh, resolution, you are going to see that um, there are certain aspects of the Abidjan uh, uh, principles which are being uh, uh, referred to. Though no specific mention is made, then there is also resolution 434, 2020, which is a, a, a resolution on the need to develop norms on states' obligations to regulate private actors involved in the provision of social services. Now, in this particular resolution, there is a specific mention of the Abidjan principles. So you can clearly see that uh, the commission, the African commission, drew inspiration from uh, the Abidjan principles when they were coming up with uh, this uh, important uh, document. Now, the aftermath of Resolution 434 of 2020 is the general comment. Is the general comment that uh, came out. And uh, that general comment is the one that also deals with uh, the issues to do with uh, the state's obligations to regulate uh, the private uh, state actors in the context of provision of uh, social uh, services. Now, in addition to these laws, the commission has also adopted the protocol for the African Charter on Human and uh, People's Rights on the Rights of Citizens to Social Protection and Security, which is yet unfortunately to come into effect. But it also seeks to ensure the realization of the right to education among other rights once you read this particular document. So without doubt, the Abidjan principles are very fundamental in the works of uh, the African Commission, and they were quite inspirational in uh, the manner in which we did the resolution in 2019, the resolution in 2020, and ultimately uh, the general comment uh, number seven. 
which is uh, an instrument which uh, draws inspiration from the Abidjan principles. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Uh, but it has the Abidjan principles has in Paris documents not only at the African level. We have also seen the influence at uh, that they had they have had in the inter-American system. So I'm going to call again the Special Rapporteur on Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights of the Inter-American System um, to ask him directly, um, the, how do you see how, if you could elaborate a little bit more on how the Abidjan principles influence the inter-American principles on academic freedom and university autonomy. Javier, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Magdalena. Eh, la, la, lo, estos principios no, no solo han sido importantes, Magdalena, para, en relación al, al trabajo de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos y su relatoría especial sobre derechos económicos, sociales, culturales y ambientales en el marco de la temática libertad académica y autonomía universitaria. Es cierto que a partir del de 2021 hemos aprobado este instrumento este, que su preámbulo hace referencia a los principios Avillán y, y que subraya la importancia de estos principios en el marco educativo global y específicamente en el desarrollo de nuevas normas vinculadas a, a educación superior. Pero no es la primera vez que, que, que desde la Redesca y desde la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, o sea, desde la Comisión y su Relatoría Especial, consideran a estos principios. Ya en noviembre del 2019, no, no, no quiero disputar la, la, la primacía con la Comisión Africana, pero ya en noviembre del 2019, en el informe de Empresas y Derechos Humanos, la Redesca había manifestado su apoyo explícito a estos principios, considerando que los mismos suponen una valiosa fuente especializada para la interpretación de los estándares interamericanos en materia de derecho a la, a la educación. Y esta referencia este, a los principios, tanto en el documento específico sobre libertad académica como en el informe sobre empresas y derechos humanos, no es casual, ¿no? Y tampoco es casual que hayan sido estas partes del mundo las que en primera instancia encontraron en este instrumento, en estos principios, una herramienta útil para avanzar en la interpretación de, de su normativa. Eh, esta, esta referencia a, a los principios reconoce la, la relevancia de establecer un enfoque integral en la educación, donde este, la provisión de... Eh, servicios educativos por parte de entidades privadas en términos generales, la libertad académica y la autonomía universitaria sean vistas como una extensión del derecho a la educación y se pueda enmarcar todo esto dentro de las obligaciones que eh, eh, han eh, asumido los estados en relación al derecho a la educación desde la perspectiva de la provisión de servicios públicos, la regulación del sector privado, etc. Esta agenda que proponen este, los principios de Avillán ofrecen una base sobre la cual argumentar este, la necesidad de avanzar en políticas públicas este, de regulación del sector privado, de garantía del derecho a la educación a través de la provisión de servicios públicos, pero además permite argumentar que la libertad académica y la autonomía universitaria son esenciales para la calidad y para tener una educación superior inclusiva, este, democrática y diversa. Eh, de, este, de esta perspectiva, eh, y para mencionar alguna cuestión más específica, este documento ofrece para la Relatoría Especial que está a mi cargo un marco de referencia y de interpretación de, la, de los estándares interamericanos especialmente relevante en dos aspectos. El primero, la labor de monitoreo. A la hora de mirar la situación específica del derecho a la educación en nuestros países, en cada uno de los países sujetos al monitoreo de la redesca, que son todos los países miembros de la OEA, de la Organización de los Estados Americanos, o sea, todo el hemisferio, 
Nosotros tenemos un, un, un lente para observar los sistemas educativos y la garantía de lo, del derecho a la educación con mucha mayor precisión y poder observar específicamente aspectos que tienen que ver, por ejemplo, con los que ya he mencionado, la provisión de servicios la, por parte de entidades privadas, la regulación, temas que tienen que ver con la cobertura a través de este, servicios públicos, el tema del financiamiento, entre otros. Y el otro aspecto que me parece eh, especialmente relevante y útil este documento para el trabajo que desarrollamos en la Relatoría Especial tiene que ver con ofrecernos una mirada centrada en los diseños de políticas públicas, centradas en la lógica de encontrar la institucionalidad, la normativa y las prácticas institucionales como un conjunto que tiene que ser abordado desde nuestra tarea en términos de organización regional de derechos humanos que forma parte del sistema interamericano de derechos humanos. De esos dos aspectos me parece que es un, un instrumento de extrema utilidad y bueno, por eso lo, lo ha sido citado este, desde noviembre del 2019 por parte de, de esta oficina y por eso lo usamos diariamente en la labor de nuestro monitoreo de la situación del derecho a la educación en los estados del hemisferio. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Javier. This, this was very uh, useful. Now we're going to move, we're going to cross the Atlantic. We're going to move from Washington DC to the UK. And I have the pressure, the, the pleasure of bringing now to the discussion, Professor Sandy Friedman, Professor of Law uh, at Oxford University. Uh, Sandy, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, you were one of the members of the Abigen Principles Drafting Group, and now you're also leading the development of the guiding principle on early childhood care and education. So uh, the question that I have for you is, how have the Abigen Principles served as an inspiration? You have the floor. Um, thanks so much, Madalena, and I'm so glad to be here at the fifth anniversary of the Abhijan Principles. Uh, and I would like to say how honored and inspired I was to be part of the drafting committee and have worked together and collaboratively over so many countries, so many stakeholders, experts and advocates. And I think it was this momentum and energy from the collaboration um, that Uh, brought us towards the central goal which we all set, which was to reinvigorate the key duty of states to provide quality education for every single person. And I think this shows how that engaging with international human rights law from a very wide um, civil society perspective can be effective and positive. Uh, so this has certainly inspired me to take the work forward um, in relation to the youngest among us, uh, that is uh, preschool, children from birth until they reach school. Uh, and for these children, education and stimulation is key from the moment of birth and well before they reach formal education. In this area, there's an equally urgent need to set out the obligations in international law, which are at present overlooked, especially after COVID, where many facilities were closed down and, and never opened up again. In this field, the early childhood education field, there are all, also some of the very same challenges, maybe even writ larger as we face in the Abidjan principles. The most glaring of these is the vast inequality between children who can access quality early care and education and those who can't. And this inequality is frequently because states are not providing sufficiently publicly funded programs and instead are leaving it to private provision. So the role of private providers in early childhood education remains very central and very challenging. Uh, and this private provision exacerbates inequalities because they can range from very expensive private childcare chains where many multinational corporations are now being uh, are now taking on early, um, early childhood care for high fees. Um, and this is contrasted with the kind of care either provided in a small way by the state or provided in a very informal way 
by community members, uh, the neighbours who might take in neighbours' children in uh, poor conditions with very little infrastructure. So the key message of Abhijan, which is the need for proper quality state-funded education for all, is even clearer for early childhood care and education and the need for us to collaborate across many stakeholders, lawyers, experts, advocates, cross countries, um, for which we can get inspired by Abhijan continues. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Joshua, we just saw how the Abhijan principles has been used, how they have been an inspiration to different other human rights instrument and uh, instrument regarding education. So I um, pass it on to you to explore the future of the Abhijan principles. Thank, Thank you, Magdalena. Thank you, Sandy. It's been an amazing journey to listen to all of this work. And in the 19 minutes or so, that we have left 18 minutes I see now maybe I could, we can call on many of our experts once again to give us their concluding thoughts in terms of the future so could I maybe get from you maybe a minute and a half Anne if you don't mind um really what how can these play how can these principles play a pivotal role in advancing the spirit of the Abhijan principles over to you Anne well I think that you know all of the processes that we've been talking about give us a very wide canvas for the work that we can take forward with the Abhijan principles. Um, the conversations are clearly getting sharper. You know, in other words, we're get, we're finding the, the niches, new, new information around early childhood education, which I think is an interesting space that, although the Abhijan principles broadly touched on, more detail is something that could definitely um, <clears throat> we benefit from. And then we've also, in this conversation, talked about all the ways in which um, those working on the ground can actually advance their work by using the, the Abhijan principles, whether it be through litigation, whether it be through um, advocacy work, whether it be through the accountability mechanisms or monitoring mechanisms in the United Nations or at the regional level as well. So I think there are so many ways in which we can still um, utilize these instruments, the, these principles um, that we perhaps haven't fully engaged with yet. Um, so I feel that the, on the one hand, this is a moment for us to take stock and say, yes, there does seem to have been an impact. People have been using the principles and we can see some evidence of that, but we can still do more. And we can still think about how we can um, weave the principles um, into our work going forward and um, take them further by bringing them into the specific spaces of work um, that are going on, whether it, you know, whichever part of the transformation of the right to education that we're all talking about, um, how that can be um, enhanced through using the Abhijan principle. So I feel quite hopeful that we're at a, a good um, vantage point for further conversations. And I think this, this conversation that we've had today is a good starting point for us for going forward on these areas of work. Brilliant, Anne, thank you very much. Javier, could you maybe reflect on that in the Americas context? Yes, Joshua, thank you. I, I, uh, yo creo que, que, que desde el, el ámbito regional, los principios pueden ser muy útiles a la hora de pensar algunas acciones que inclusive se relacionan con el actual el plan de trabajo de, de, la, de la Relatoria Especial sobre Derechos Económicos, Sociales, Culturales y Ambientales en el que estamos, eh, que está siendo elaborado en estos momentos este, con una gran participación de organizaciones de la, de la sociedad civil y específicamente organizaciones vinculadas al, al derecho a la educación y ahí hay varios aspectos que me parecen fundamentales en esta interrelación entre el plan de trabajo que estamos elaborando para los próximos tres años de la Relatoría Especial y, y este instrumento específico el primero tiene que ver con el financiamiento adecuado ¿no? la necesidad de abordar la temática de la provisión de servicios públicos y su financiamiento desde una perspectiva integral que tenga en consideración no solo aspectos vinculados 
a la, al aparato estatal vinculado a la, a la provisión de servicios públicos, sino específicamente aspectos referidos a la política fiscal y a los diseños de política fiscal. El otro aspecto que me parece interesante en este ejercicio de vinculación del plan de trabajo que estamos desarrollando y esperamos tener aprobado a final de este mes, principios de marzo, y eh, esta discusión que, y este instrumento de los principios de Villán es el tema de regulación del sector privado y la agenda de empresas y derechos humanos eh, y de garantía de los derechos económicos, sociales, este, culturales a través de la provisión de servicios por parte de, de entidades de carácter eh, privado, por parte del sector este, privado. ¿no? La lógica de, 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 de complementarización, la lógica de, de, de prioridad de la oferta educativa este, pública, existen consideraciones muy, muy interesantes en este ejercicio y en este diálogo. Y por último, el, el otro aspecto, el último aspecto que me parece especialmente relevante en este, en este ejercicio de vincular, vuelvo a decir, el plan de trabajo de la Redesca para los próximos años con, con los principios de, de Avillán, creo que eh, es muy importante la mirada de inclusión, de accesibilidad, de diversidad que está detrás de los principios y la mirada de interseccionalidad que pensamos desarrollar como eje de carácter transversal para la actividad de la Relatoría Especial sobre Derechos Económicos, Sociales, Culturales y Ambientales para los próximos tres años. Esto implica eh, entender a las políticas públicas, específicamente a, a las políticas de carácter educativa, desde esta perspectiva este, ya un poco desgastada, de, de que nadie quede atrás, pero que es tan valiosa y que es tan necesaria retomar desde una perspectiva y desde una mirada más, yo creo, más técnica y más orientada a resultados y al impacto en la, en la realidad a través de políticas públicas, instituciones concretas que tengan la posibilidad de no dejar a nadie atrás en sus acciones y en sus prácticas institucionales. Esos aspectos me parecen como, como los los más significativos en realidad, mirando al futuro, un poco mirando el futuro de la redesca, de la Relatoría Especial, y viendo este diálogo y esta interrelación entre los principios de Avillán y lo que nosotros pensamos eh, desarrollar. Y los principios son un marco de referencia internacional crucial, eh, proporciona sin duda este, para los organismos internacionales, para el gobierno, para la sociedad civil, una, una base para avanzar en agendas vinculadas a, a derechos, al derecho a la educación, es una inspiración y, y de, ese, de esa perspectiva lo estamos tomando muy en consideración en el marco de, de nuestro trabajo. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Javier. ¿Qué sobre uh, uh, el comisionado Mart para el contexto africano? Quizás se puede identificar en 90 segundos. Gracias. Bueno, gracias mucho. Voy a empezar de the situation which uh, we heard from Nepal. I think the manner in which they are putting the Abidjan principles to use is very inspirational. To me, it's, it gives me an idea that uh, I think uh, it should be put in such a way that uh, it's put across to government so that uh, the right to education is made to be a justiciable right. Because right now in most of our African countries, for instance, it's not a justiciable right. So for me, the basis upon which we can advocate for it to become a justiciable right lies in us championing the Abidjan principles. The Abidjan principles can be used to inform policy, to inform legislation about the right to education. We've already got a document which I think is worth putting forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mudford. So we've heard from stakeholders. Perhaps we can hear from our researchers and maybe researchers, here's an extra challenge for you. If you can maybe give us three keywords in terms of what you think the future should hold. So, and without 
without uh, giving you enough uh, enough notice of this, uh, David, may I call upon you? What would be your three words for the future of the Abhijan principles? Do you want to go first, Frank? <laughs> uh, three words. Um, I think there needs to be uh, investment, implementation, and regulation. Very clear. What about you, for, for you, Prachi? What would be your three keywords? Not good with keywords, uh, because <laughs> I think the reason, I think, I think Frank has already said the main ones. The reason I'm not good with those kinds of answers on this issue is that it's far too complex to, to boil down into three words. What I would say is that um, the point of justiceability is very important. Um, and I would say that we need to start approaching the right to education and education generally less as a technical enterprise and more as a normative imperative. And I think that's really the point here. The, the principles provide a really strong framework, but they are based in law, which ultimately are around norms and values. And we need to be very clear about that. So we need to ask big questions. Why is it, for example, that we allow um, pretty much free reign in pre-primary education? Why is that? When we know that that's a critical period for um, skills development, for all sorts of socio-emotional learning, for, for, for a real integrated start from birth all the way through life. So the two things I would say is a normative imperative and to view the implementation of the Abhijan principles through a continuous progressive system that starts from birth and goes all the way through adulthood and into old age. Thank you, Prachi. David Riban? Yes. Yeah, yes. Um, I won't be very serious and I will answer to your question by my three keywords be regulation, regulation and regulation. <laughs> Sorry for that, but to be, to, to, to be serious, to be serious, two keywords, yeah. regulation, of course, uh, and Frank will uh, talk about it. And I will also add a new one, common good. I think that education um, is not only a right, it's a common good that we need to reinforce. And the Abidjan principle are probably the only tool we have for that, both in the global south and also in the north context. Brilliant, David. Thank you very much. What about for you, Sandy? So I would like to add to the words that have already been given equality, because it seems to me that as inequalities grow exponentially, the foundations of inequality are settled from in the education system. And the more inequality we get in education, again, from birth all the way to higher education, the more that um, multiplies and accelerates uh, later on in life. So in order to assure that we can reduce inequality, we have to provide good quality education equally to everyone, state provided. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. What about our civil society organization representatives? And Karuna, what for you would be three words or a key sentiment you want to put forward? Well, I'm also not good at uh, assigning the words. But uh, what uh, we felt, you know, like um, the uh, getting judgment itself is not enough. You know, like in other parts of the world, implementation is again another challenge. So whenever we are demanding right to education, from quote best uh, quote best engagement, uh, we need to combine it with other social movements, and uh, that's my uh, first thing that I would say. And second is I was also checking the um, uh, discussion, and there are some people who are trying to create a false narrative uh, 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 surrounding Abidan principles, saying that look, it has like you know it gives space for private education, so. Uh, private investors. So we need to collectively fight against such kind of negative narrative to ensure two things. First, as Abidan principle claims, and we need to firmly um, uh, call upon states as uh, Abidan principle that states are the primary duty bearers of right to education. And second, states has uh, re responsibility to regulate, not delegate its obligation to uh, ensure right to education to privatized education providers. Thank you.
Thank you, Karuna. From Nepal to Kenya, Johnston, what would you add to this? Thank you. For me, three things. Uh, there is the issue of accountability. A civil society organization will still continue to put pressure on the state to ensure accountability and compliance with already passed regulations. Number two, there is the issue of regulation, just ensuring that there are proper regulations, to, especially to um, monitor the implementation of right to education. And finally, the issue of implementation. We have quite a lot of policies, but most of the time they are not implemented to meet the uh, right holders' uh, uh, needs. Thank you. Thank you, Johnston. And then over to you, Priya, at UNESCO, as a last word in terms of the reaction here. Um, thank you so much. I think we clearly need to raise the alarm bells on privacy, commercialization of data, marketing, um, and also get both the international and national communities to do all they can to hold global and local companies together. It's a tough task, but I feel like it requires the levels of action. Um, I just wanted to end by saying that you know, we chose the subtitle, Who Chooses, Who Loses, for the 2021-2022 report on non-state actors. We want governments to do a better job, um, you know, to, uh, to of meeting equity goals, preserve the right to education through all of our assessments of evidence, policies, and trends. You know, preserving and supporting public education is really the only way we can get closer to achieving equity. We also, I feel like there's a lot of complex reasons for this, but government capacity and issues of trust also come up. I would say two things. Um, it's important to find ways to shift the narrative, um, maybe highlight the, how the combination of political commitments and financing can strengthen public education and also public sector capacity to manage and balance relationships with uh, you know, private actors. And I think to shift norms, um, as I think Prachi had mentioned, the importance of networks is important to continue building coalitions of the like-minded people who are here, but also it would be great five years later to see more people, a broader coalition of people who are not here and maybe are more uh, swayed by the arguments. So that's where I would leave it. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. Magdalena, with 120 seconds to go and a lot of people to thank for a phenomenal seminar, over to you to close us out. Thank you. Thank you. It has been a phenomenal seminar, as you said, Joshua. I invite everyone to put the cameras on so we can take a picture of everybody. Uh, thanks also to the interpreters. We spoke very, very fast. You did an amazing work. So uh, thank you from all of us. And this, as we said at the beginning, this is to trigger and to continue collaborating uh, more uh, networks and more people working on the Avigen principles and uh, regulation, global good, equality, broad movement, where one of the few words that were set for the future. And we look forward to that. Thank you to all. And please be there for the photo. <laughs> so, <laughs> bye.